On behalf of the Board of Management of Matter Day Academy, I'm delighted to welcome you to this video, the next in a series of videos that we're doing on various educational topics relevant to Catholic ethos and liberal arts education. Tonight, I'm delighted to be here in the Benedictine Priory in Cove. We're hosted kindly by the sisters here, and we're going to talk with Father Dermot Finlan about St. John Henry Newman's contribution to education. So, Father, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, would you like to kick off just by talking about the contribution you've seen from Sir Je St. Henry Newman, his contribution to education in Ireland? Well, in Ireland? Well, um, I, I, yes, I could do that. Uh, I suppose we have to recognise that uh, his most famous uh, educational treatise, The Idea of a University, uh, was uh, um, prepared in Ireland for an Irish audience and it was the first time that anybody had worked up an idea of what a Catholic university might be about. It has since become a classic, a universal classic, uh, recognised as the, the quintessential guide to what a university education should be, but I think people often forget that the word is Catholic education, and I'd like to think that we should focus on that. If you ask me about the effect on Ireland, I would say that contrary to what is very often said, namely that Newman's Catholic University in Ireland was a failure, uh, I would say that's not quite the whole truth that it certainly petered out uh, for various reasons, uh, mostly because the Catholics of that time, the middle class and upper class Catholics, didn't want to send their Catholic children to a place uh, which wouldn't be as prestigious as uh, Trinity College Dublin. And uh, so that would be one reason. The other was the university didn't attract a charter from the British government and uh, Newman understood that uh, was also a very important limitation. But it didn't stop the university, and this is the point I want to make, from having a lasting, um, shall we say, presence in people mm -hmm. whom Newman formed in Dublin. And those people were those who founded the medical school, which provided a Catholic education, new thing for Catholic doctors in Ireland for the subsequent century and also in what became UCD in, in, in the 20th century, uh, the Literary and Historical Debating Society, which is exactly what Newman had in mind as a basis for learning how to publicly communicate on issues of controversy and to do so with confidence, to stand on your two feet, uh, because it required an education which enabled you to take any subject and go to the heart of it and talk coherently about it in ways that judge the temper of your audience. Now we come back to Ireland because I can say from personal experience that at the, I was born in 1941 and by the time in 1956 I, I, was, I was a you know, child in the Christian Brothers College Monkstown in Dublin. Uh, those teachers knew Newman. They had the spirit of Newman, they had more than that, they had the detail of Newman. I remember one of them in particular with great respect, Robert Mahoney was his name. And he taught, I sat up, I remember, I can still see it in class, that there was somebody called Cardinal Newman, and he distinguished, the heart of his teaching was to distinguish between notional and real assent in matters of religion. Now, absolutely, that goes mm. to the whole heart and centre of what Newman's mm. about, of what we need to be about as mm -hmm. well. But he didn't stop there. He also mentioned the great importance uh, in the church's teaching of the sense of the faithful. When there is a crisis of faith, drawing the church back to her true understanding. And that lot, and that too goes to the heart of what Newman gave us. And I can also recall uh, lay historians who taught us that the, one of them in particular, a wonderful man called McNeve, who taught us there were two sides to everything, except on Leary Station. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was pure Newman. Yeah. And uh, uh, he taught us that uh, Newman always understood that education was about the whole person, not just about the intellect. 
inclusive, but of course, that is about the heart of the feelings, the emotion, what it means to be human. And with that in my mind, I later was a city college at Blackwell College, and we had a wonderful, wonderful um, religion teacher, Father Vincent Dynan, who really inspired me anyway, uh, with his account of Newman's conversion to the church in 1845, having been the most outstanding preacher that the church of England had ever seen at Oxford, and head of what was called the Oxford Movement to re-Catholicize the Church of England. After 1845, becoming a Catholic, he became uh, the author of a book called The Development of Human Doctrine. And I remember Father Dynan saying, that teaches us that doctrine develops rather as a human being develops. Uh, like an acorn, it develops into an oak tree. It's consistent with its origins and becomes, with God's grace, becomes an oak tree. Lovely, those lovely. metaphors of yeah. ascent and development remained with me. And so finally, I found myself at a university college Dublin. I had a brief period studying English literature, and Jeremiah Hogan walked us through the scope and nature of university education. Uh, that was 1958. And I always remember one quotation which, for me, came straight out of Discourse 8 of the idea of a university. Which, and here it is. Yeah. Quarry the granite rock with razors, or moor the vessel with a thread of silk. Then may you hope, with such keen and delicate instruments as human knowledge and human reason, to contest against those giants, the passions and the pride of math. Lovely, lovely. So just to recap on your own education, and you've referenced it there, so you, you were educated by the Christian Brothers, Blackrock College, you went on to study history in UCD, yeah. then you went from there to Cambridge, yes. uh, where you did research and taught, and from there you then went um, to Beta College in Rome to study uh, to become Theology, a priest, yes. and uh, following your ordination you were in East Anglia uh, Diocese, the uh, Diocese of East, East Anglia, Anglia correct. East Anglia yes, Diocese. Yes, yes. And then you spent almost 20 years um, in the Newman Oratory in um, Birmingham. And from there then, providentially, you came and helped the founding of Newman College in Ireland. And from there, here to resident chaplain in the Benedictine Convent in oh, Cove. Um, so a really comprehensive uh, journey through. Yes. And yes. what are the, the moments in your own education that really stood out? And if you were talking to students in Matter Day Academy in Cork, uh, what would you say to them about the opportunity they're getting in you know, the Catholic and the classical liberal arts education? What would you say to those students now in first year and second year in Matter Day Academy? In Matter Day Academy, yeah. I'd say, well, you are very blessed. Uh, to be in a community of teachers who understand what Newman wanted us to understand, that education means the full development and full potential of the human person. And it's the human person as uh, given to us uh, by God. And uh, instead of just being, as we've seen in that quotation, uh, looking to merely human knowledge and mere human reason, we're looking to the recuperation of human knowledge mm -hmm. and the redemption of human reason by communion with the church. And that is really the heart of, of Newman's understanding of a Catholic education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the church uh, redeems what is weak in human nature, that education itself, necessary, good and true as it should be, uh, can have the adverse effect of promoting pride mm -hmm. and passion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in those who slaughter each other mm -hmm. in matters of polemics, mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of learning with Newman how mm -hmm. to communicate. Excellent. So just to be so that's something we every one in education needs to be cognizant of, I suppose, that danger of when you're not uh, looking towards, you know, as you reference some of the cardinal sins, etc. Um, that's something that we just need to be cognizant of. What were the particular concerns that St. John Henry Newman had about the education system that he saw? Yes. Well, you see, that's a very important question. Let me put it this way. Uh, let me put it this way. Um, 
1945, that's a centenary year, the year after he entered the Catholic Church, 1845, centenary, uh, a very great English historian, Catholic, Christopher Dawson, remarked that Newman was the first Christian thinker in the English-speaking world who fully realized the nature of modern secularism mm. and the enormous change which, in his own day, was already in the process of development, although a century had still to pass before it was to produce its full harvest of destruction. Now, Chris would also said that in the wake of the Second World War. It's a remarkable thing to have said because almost identically and at the same time in Munich, a young seminarian named Joseph Ratzinger mm -hmm. uh, began his studies in a bombed out Munich the centre of that place which had been destroyed. And I to quote what he said, what he tells us himself about entering the seminary in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. He says this, For us at that time, Newman's teaching on conscience, and that's really now the next step mm -hmm. in the formation in education, educating people to have a conscience which is illuminated by divine revelation, by the truth, and fostered. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger, as he was then, used the image of conscience as a plant which needs the right degrees of temperature, soil, and heat before it can flower. Mm -hmm. And that's the ethos sure. of Catholic education. So here he is saying for us, <coughs> in that in <coughs> seminary of 1946, Newman's teaching on conscience became an important foundation for what he calls theological personalism. Now, uh, there he means, and this is the next big thing with Newman, uh, what it means to become a human person, as God wants us to be human formation in that sense. Theologically grounded. That means not as a subject called theology, but in God. Mm. Theologos. <laughs> and uh, to be able to develop that theologos in our lives and the practical matter of life. Now he says that that attractive theology was drawing us in a new way. He says our image of the human being, now this is Germany in 1946, let's move forward to where we are now. Our image of the human being as well as our image of the church was permeated by this human's point of departure. We had experienced in Germany the claim of a totalitarian party which understood itself as the fulfillment of history and which negated the conscience of the individual. One of its leaders, it was, I think, Goebbels, said, I have no conscience. My conscience is Adolf Hitler. The appalling devastation of humanity that followed was, said the young Ratzinger, before our eyes. And so it was liberating and essential for us to know that the we of the church, that is each human person, does not rest on a cancellation of conscience, but that exactly the opposite. It can only develop from conscience. And now we come to the fourth point in Newman's understanding of the human person, development of the human person. And again, we look to something that Pope Benedict still said in 1990, still talking about his formation as a priest in the seminary of 1946. He says, it was from Newman that we learned to understand the primacy of the Pope. Freedom of conscience, Newman told us, is not identical with the right to dispense, as he puts it, Newman puts it, to dispense with conscience. The modern misunderstanding of conscience is, conscience is what I decide, and that's actually dispensing with the voice of God in the soul, which is the conscience of Christ telling us and to the original teacher in the soul. So Newman says that you can't dispense with conscience uh, if you ignore the lawgiver and the judge. And so Ratzinger goes on to say, Benedict goes on to say, thus conscience in its true sense is the bedrock of papal authority. Its power comes from revelation that completes natural conscience which is imperfectly enlightened, thus the image of the soil, light, and so on. And uh, he goes on to, to show us how Newman's understanding of the church 
is that then of the, which ultimately came that of the Vatican Council, which was still, still beginning and only beginning to understand because of the false interpretations that have proliferated. But when we understand Newman, we'd have got the Vatican Council right because he'd been correctly described as one of the grandparents of the Second Vatican Council. In terms of formation of conscience, you know, when you have a group of students and you're taking them through, you know, the liberal arts curriculum and you're teaching them or, you know, bringing them on a journey to develop their ability to critically think, etc. What are the techniques that you've seen that are effective? What are the effective techniques in terms of formation of conscience of in students? Yes, 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 of course. Uh, well, I think that's an important question because there are two levels to it. Uh, Newman distinguishes in the idea of university between uh, the idea of education in itself, which is uh, actually a Greek and Roman idea, uh, which has nothing to do with Christianity, but has got to do with God, because there is such a thing as natural religion and consciousness of a duty towards God became the keynote of an Aristotelian from Aristotle in Greek philosophy, a motif that was taken up by Cicero in the Roman political world for the education of his son. And Cicero wrote a book called uh, De Officius, uh, how, how to bring up young people so that they have what we would call a moral compass. And that moral compass would have to be informed from within by a just sense of what is right and what is wrong. Now, in each person's case, how that conscience comes to be formulated is, 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 of course, a great question. Let's begin with Newman. I think the answer is, ask Newman what happened to him. Shall we do that? Yes, absolutely. But then we open up the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, and it's all there in the first six or seven great. pages. Uh, shall I go for Do, please, Father. Very good. I was brought up from a child, he says, that would be in, in 1801 onwards, to take great delight in reading the Bible, but I had no formed religious convictions till I was 15. Of course, I had a perfect knowledge of my catechism. After I was grown up, I can remember looking back and seeing the course of my development turned on what I was like when I was 15. This is where conscience begins to become real for me. Mm -hmm. In the autumn of 1816, he said, for a year previously, I had been reading and taking pleasure in thinking of the objections which were contained to Christianity in the writers of the day. And he mentioned certain writers like uh, Hume, who was a skeptic, and Voltaire, and others who attacked uh, Christianity. And in denial of the immortality of the soul, and I remember saying to myself at that age, 14, how dreadful, but how plausible. So already he was shifting in the direction of unbelief. When I was 15, that's the autumn of 1816, a great change of thought took place in me. I fell under the influences of a definite creed and received into my intellect impressions of dogma, which through God's mercy have never been effaced or obscured. And helped by the conversations and sermons of his teacher, the Reverend Walter Mayers of the time at Ealing College, which was outside London, this was the beginning of the human means of divine faith in me. And the books that he gave me to read fostered that sense of obligation to a divine source. That is to say, obviously, from conscience, you know. The doctrine of final perseverance, he said, I received it at once. But then I came to see later on that this Calvinist understanding was, was too narrow. And he describes how subsequently there was pastoral experience in the Church of England which brought him to see you can't divide people in your congregation into who are the goats and who are the sheep because it's actually you have to begin with yourself. So the conscience in Newman, this whole point about this wonderful book, is that it's all about how conscience grows and grows and grows and shows him. It's all summed up in his hymn, Lead Kindly Light Through the Encircling Gloom, Lead Thou Me Out. I was not ever just not prayed that thou shouldst lead me on. I love to choose and see my will, but now lead thou me on. Lovely. And I suppose, you know, as you kind of form children and teenagers in a secondary school environment um, to develop a conscience, yep. 
to think criti think critically for themselves. Uh -huh. uh, what are there any specific? Yeah, yeah I do want to say something. Yeah. Family. Family. Right. Yeah. Uh, Newman tells us that he owed everything to his father when it came to the crunch. Right. Once he got religious conversion, his first conversion, he had three. Uh, he became what was called an evangelical, and that meant uh, me and Jesus and the Bible and there's nothing else. Yeah. Know. Uh, we know that, we know that. So, so. But his father said to him, shortly before he decided on ordination, he said, you are becoming, he said, ultra. Now that word becomes a real negative word with Newman. You are becoming ultra. You keep talking all the time about the Bible and telling us what to do about all that. And you now have to decide for yourself, are you going to be something, do you want to be a lawyer or do you want to be a churchman? What are you going to do? And Newman took the rebuke, it was a rebuke. And he says, I realize it was a rebuke. And uh, it was thanks to my father that I made the decision to step into the way of ordination in the Church of England. So family influence, in a sense of a directive like that, a corrective like that. And then the wonderful moment at his ordination in holy orders in the Anglican Church, as he then understood it, he says on the day of his ordination as deacon, uh, at last it's, it's over, you have me, Lord, I am yours. I have on me the responsibility of souls to my dying day. And the whole of his subsequent evolution of life is following out the obligations which come from within to the service of the community without. So I don't know whether that begins to answer your question. There comes a critical moment. Mm -hmm. And if the soul is turned in direction of the sunlight, if you like that, yes. in yeah. the beautiful image of the sunflower, which can go into the dark or into the light. If the soul is turned into the direction of the light, then lead kindly light. It will be led to a light. And we'll see there are lots of things. Oh, oh I've got to change this, I've got to change that. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes. <laughs> yes. And Father, just in terms of subjects on the curriculum, like theology, philosophy, mm. Latin, yes. um, do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of subjects like that? I think so. Yes, well, we've talked about uh, the importance for, for, for Newman of the discovery. First of all, he was at a school which uh, gave him this good foundation, and he already knew Greek and Latin, and since for a long time he left school, along with all the English history and the rest of it. Was, but when he got to Oxford, uh, he found himself in a place where the battle was fighting between the new secularism, which was taking God out of education, and a, a theory of education which was what was called liberal education, which means the education of a free person. And that was grounded precisely in the idea of what it meant for Greek philosophy with Latin uh, idea of personal formation through adolescence into the sense of responsibility and public responsibility to the duties of the public world. That was the ethos. Uh, of course, it was still marginally corrected by a Christian, but it receding Christian presence. So in that way, he, he went to Oxford and found himself as a fellow of Oriel College, at, uh, surrounded by people who taught him to think and measure his words. And he says, really, he learned to begin to think about liberal education from the provost of Oriel College called Edward Copleson, who used the Latin phrase, um, not, not multa, said Moulton. Don't, don't go for trying to know everything. Just know something very well and get to know it very well and know how to articulate it. So with that in view, he then it's converged with both the classical tradition of knowing what it is to be a public speaker and how to communicate with a real responsibility before God, how to communicate Christianity. And his sermons at that time now become informed by this key element in his, 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 his teaching, uh, that Christianity is communicated through persons, through personal influence. Now, it's not the manipulative influence of this world, but through the sort of person you are. And already as a pastor in the Church of England, uh, when he was a deacon, it's lovely, he was in the pastor in, um, outside Oxford in St. Clement's Church, and he describes how he went into somebody's doctor and door, and he was doing visitation, and the woman opened up, and she said to him, oh, she said, looking at him, it was like seeing Jesus in the picture. Well, everybody who saw, that's the whole secret, you know, what people saw in him. And it's 
precisely that is when those 20,000 people lined the street, they, they hadn't read the crown of the saint. They hadn't read the idea of a person, but they'd seen the saint yes. and they knew who it was. And it's that radiating love of God that pours out in Newman that people saw. And, you know, people said so. The Gladstone I said about him years later, he said this was the greatest preacher Oxford had ever seen. But we knew that it was backed up by a character which was pure and pure of heart and which drew people by his love of God. Lovely, lovely. That's hugely important, that the love of God comes across in the, the culture of the school, etc. We're ha um, Matter Day Academy are having their open day uh, on the 4th of November. Um, what would you say to parents who are discerning whether to send their child to a school like Matter Day, a secondary school like Matter Day? I'd say you're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yes, yes, uh, you have here what Newman wanted for Ireland. Yes. And you have the first opportunity to actually keep it going. We started it 150 years ago, then went out more, but it repeated out. Keep going. Yes. Uh, one of the quotes from Newman that really struck me was he said, A liberal education enables the learner to develop their minds and think for themselves. Yes. And, you know, in terms of forming our young people, isn't that a lovely quote oh, from, from... That's, that's it. From, uh, that's it. From Cardinal and Lund. that goes back yeah. to, his, to his formal education at Oriel College. He got it from a figure called Whiteley, who later became the Anglican Archbishop of Dublin. And Whiteley used to say, I'm going to teach you to think. He said, um, and he was very shy, you see. Uh, and he, said, he used to say to his students who would come, now look, what do you want? Do you want me to cram you for a first class honours degree? Or do you want me to teach you to think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Before we, um, before we conclude, um, any other remarks, anything else you wanted to um, point out in terms of uh, St. John Henry Newman? I think we've covered an awful lot, but I just wanted to yes. see if there were any closing yes. when, points. When Pope Benedict uh, canonised him in Birmingham in 2010, uh, he said it was the educational idea that we should be looking at and developing. But he also said something very profound, which I believe to be true, that there is still much more that we don't know about Newman. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to the students, get to know him. Research and yeah, get to know him. Uh, so thank you very much, Father, for coming along to the video here tonight. Um, for Matter Day Academy, um, this video will go up on our YouTube channel. So you can watch it on our YouTube channel, on our, on our website, www.matterdayacademy.ie um, We ask for your support for Matter Day Academy. You can support us financially or alternatively, or you can support us uh, financially, but also by your prayers. And your prayers for the Matter Day Academy are very, very important. Um, and we will keep, keep tuned in to our website for further videos in this series. And you can also sign up to our newsletter on our website, again, www.matterdayacademy.ie. So, Father, I might now ask you to close tonight's video with a prayer. Thank you. Eternal Father, we thank you for the grace which you have given us in the sanctity of John Henry Newman. He described his idea of a university as the seat of wisdom and the light of the world. We ask you that the mother of Jesus should carry that light through the Matter Day Academy from Ireland to be the light which he had in mind for our world. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen.